Well, welcome back, everyone. And it is November 11th, and you'll probably be seeing this afterward because it's not live. But anyway, it's November 11th, 2017, and Veterans Day in the United States. So anyway, I'm John Dupuy, and that's Dr. Bob Weathers. Hi, everybody. Uh, the beautiful guy with the gray hair and the uh, really cool guy with the black hair and the black t-shirt. I think that's black. Is Douglas <laughs> Hi, everybody. We are the um, the team, the the you know the the guys that are galloping ahead with this journey of integral recovery podcast, whom we're all a part of. If you're listening and, and participating in this journey, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, we'd like to uh, introduce the topic since today is Veterans Day. Uh, uh, we'll be. Uh, uh, working with that as a metaphor for where we go today. I do want to say this to Doug and to John. It was exactly 50 years ago today, September 11th, excuse me, uh, November 11th, 1967, that I played in my very first parade as a drummer. <laughs> I can remember that as clear as it was, 50 years ago. It was a really big deal to me. I've always remembered this on Veterans Day. There I am with my snare drum walking down the, the street playing in my very first band parade. And so I celebrate 50 years today with you guys. That's awesome. Congratulations. You know, that is really not. cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's also when Sergeant Peppers taught the band to play 50 years yes. ago. Yes. <laughs> yes. I thought yes. that was 20 yeah. years ago today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's growing on us. Well, let, 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 me, let me set the tone for this. And I think John's going to pick up the baton. Um, yesterday, I, I uh, uh, facilitated a group at the local treatment center. And uh, here's how I went, you guys. I woke up uh, uh, the night before last. That would be the uh, yeah, it'd be uh, Thursday evening. I woke up at two, and I was awake in the middle of the night. And what came to me in a, uh, in a in a flash was what I wanted to what I wanted to bring to that group. And so, um, as it goes sometimes with dreams, you know, if you don't write them down, you forget them. But as it turned out, I woke up in the morning. It was as crisp as it was given to me. And, and here's what I w did yesterday. I went in and we have a whiteboard in this room. There's about 20 uh, young men and women, for the most part, who are early in recovery from addiction, typically from heroin or meth, serious addiction. And I wrote the number three on the board and I wrote the number 51. And I said, I wanna ask you guys, we tease a lot, I wanna ask you guys three questions. And the first question is this, how many of you uh, here today, right now, feel like that you've got yourself in a place where you're at least 51% or more committed to recovery. And I said, oh, I, I proceeded by saying, what we talk about in here today, I'd ask you to keep in here because I'm going to ask questions. And I want to dialogue in a way that I want you guys to trust one another and trust that I won't be a narc either. I won't be reporting this to anybody what we talk about. So that was the question, 51% or more. And everybody in the room raised their hand except for two. And, and I picked on those two and I said, congratulations, you guys, for being courageous enough to say that you're not there. And I said, I would have done anything in my earliest recovery, especially being in the hospital, if I had been invited to ask that, answer that question. There was an assumption that just jump on the train and you're all on board. And I wasn't. I wasn't. Well, even in saying that, two other people raised their hands and they said, well, actually, the truth is. And I commended them by name as well. And so we, we spoke into that uh, for a few minutes, but it brought us to two other questions. I said there were three questions. The second question I asked the group after we talked about that uh, previous, their previous response was, for all of you, whether you're at 3% commitment or 57% commitment, what is your greatest uh, impediment to your own recovery right now in your own mind? And immediately people began speaking it out. Wow. in a room of 20 people. And I said, you guys have to stop this. I said, I'm a guy and guys have very horrible dichotic listening. And I'm on the, the very far continuum of guys. I cannot hear two people speaking at once and do anything but cancel it out. It just cancels out the communication. And so we laughed about that. And then we raised hands and people began to share. And they were, by this point, they were on board. What occurred to me, John and Doug, is that in the middle of the night, this is the very, very basic stuff that I typically don't host in a group. Why would, I, why would I dive further down the road? Why don't we just start with just really basic shit? And so that was the second question, very fruitful. But the third question then brings us to today's uh, examination. And John, I'm going to hand it to you in just a minute. The third question that came to me in the middle of the night, which I asked him as I said, what's your single greatest incentive for recovery? No matter where you are, what is your single greatest incentive? And what came of it was... 
uh, again, everybody, it was amazing, the interaction with this. Uh, there were only two people in the group that fell asleep yesterday. And honestly, for people in early recovery, that's a miracle. It was the most engaged group I've ever facilitated there. It was alive. And what came was one person after another talking about people they loved, causes that they cared about. Every one of them talked about something outside of themselves. And I have the chills even right now with it because it was so powerfully resonant. One man began to weep as he talked about not wanting his mother to die before he's sober. He does not want his mom to die knowing that he's addicted. He began to weep and I walked towards him. I just, I just felt so uh, appreciative. He's not typically an, emo an emotive man. And it, in this group, it's not typically that, that emotionally uh, kind of bare, you know, transparent. I walked towards him to shake his hand and he stood up and he just held out his arms and we held each other. And I patted him on the side and I says, this is it, you guys. Every one of you has got to find your version of this inside. If you're going to make it around the corner, I don't care where you are in recovery. You're going to have to find some reason beyond yourself that, uh, that, that gets you up in the morning and gets you dedicated to the practice. So with that, I think I'd like to pass the baton to John and just open it up where we want to go, John. But that, that was the experience yesterday. And I did want to share it with you guys. Uh, thanks to the group and uh, thanks to uh, Middle of the Night Inspiration. That comes from some place way beyond me, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. And that's, you. you know, that's such a big question. And uh, I mean, you know, we're talking about, you know, the integral model and, and you know, uh, whereas recovery is evolutionary, uh, uh, addiction is devolutionary. Yeah. You, know, you, you go from these different levels of, of mo moral caring, what you really care about. And as you move up the ladder of, of, of evolutionary uh, uh, development, that you, your capacity to care for more grows and grows and grows more strongly. And if you do it in a really balanced, integral or holistic way, it doesn't get all screwed up. And, it, you know, it actually it grows into a, a stable, a stable uh, platform to live from. And, you know, the, under the, the assault of the disease of addiction, we go downhill, you know, and then we become, you know, very egocentric. And after, I guess after a while, at the very end, we're not even egocentric anymore. We don't, we don't care about number one. We just want to die, you know, just the drugs. It's just We just want to go into annihilation. You know, like that song that we do, do this song together when we were in California, we played Heroin by uh, Velvet Underground, Lou Reed. And it was just, God, it was so powerful, but it's such a dirge, such a blues, mm -hmm. such a, a lament uh, when we do it anyway. It's, a, it's amazing. So, yeah. So, so, and, and, and I have found in, I mean, this is, you know, based on experience is that people have to have that grow into that, you know, something bigger than themselves in order to base their recovery on when you get a case of the fuckets and you just want to blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the egocentric, I mean, there's an awesome, really relevant uh, egocentric argument to be made for recovery. Do you want to go to spend your life in jail? Do you want to die? You know, but at that level, often it just don't tell me what to do. You know, there, there's a lack of uh, capacity in, in most cases to, to just shut up and listen and, and tell the people that are helping you support you in early recovery. We're talking about people that are way down in, in you know, in, in the basement. I mean, really in the last uh, progression of the disease. So you have to give that up and then you have to find something uh, mm -hmm. deeper and bigger than yourself. And of course, as we grow into, you know, the journey of integral recovery, that what we care about will continue to expand. It doesn't mean we don't still care about ourselves. We have to, right? But we transcend and include our family, you know, his mother, uh, you know, these other things. And as we continue to grow, then that 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 sphere of concern uh, and compassion grows even bigger. It doesn't mean we don't care about ourselves. It doesn't mean we don't care about our family. But we begin to care more about the world too, simultaneously transcending and including, transcending and including. And that's how the the healthy progression uh, goes up and uh, down. Is like. <laughs> Uh, the opposite of transcending is descending, I suppose, and, and excluding, descending, excluding, descending, excluding. So thinking about, uh, about um, Veterans Day, November 11th, you know, 11, 11, 11, when they signed the, 
the, the peace treaty that uh, led to World War II, unfortunately. But anyway, that's become our day of, of celebrating veterans and their sacrifices. And I'm, I'm, uh, I was in the military. I was in the Army, mm-hmm. uh, military policeman. So uh, and a lot of my family was as part of that. And so one of the things that, that you, you get in the military is that you're doing this for something besides yourself, okay? You can start with, you know, your country, you know, democracy, freedom, uh, or, you know, they say in most, you know, it's kind of a cliche now, but you fight for your buddies, but you're, you're willing to lay down your life for, for your, uh, for your comrades, for your fellow soldiers, for the people that you care about. And so it's that kind of dedication, uh, that helps you to be, you know, to push yourself beyond yourself, to become a better version of yourself, to be a better soldier. Okay. Well, the same thing that we have to, and, and, the, and the courage in that, and, and outside of the military, in our culture, it's so God damned. <laughs> and I, I, I yes, not, absolutely. Just, it's all about number one. You know, I mean, did the Trump kids ever have a desire to serve their country in the military? Are you kidding me? That's for poor people. R R R R. I got mine. You know, so you get into this this game. Or let's have a disruptive technology. Let's develop a technology that'll wipe out an industry, and we'll you know we'll make billions. And I'm not saying that's bad. Maybe that's how you know uh, technology advances. But you got to consider other things. You know, besides just ourselves. And and now we have generations of soldiers who we've been in Afghanistan and Iraq for what, thirteen years now? Thirteen freaking years. And I'm, don't get me, I don't want to get in this rant, but I just got to say this. I'm, what are we going to do if we stay another 13 years? Is the situation going to be any better? And if we haven't been able to fix it in 13 years, is 10 more going to help? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, but still they're there. They're still sacrificing and, and uh, giving their lives for something beyond themselves. So I think that's important because the disease of addiction is such a – I mean, it's like vitamins for narcissism. You know? It's like steroids for narcissism. You don't care. You care less and less and less and less mm-hmm. about anything but yourself. Then you don't even care about that anymore. It goes below that. So somehow we have to man up. We have to figure out, you know, what's worth, uh, what's worth living for, what's worth uh, dying for, what's worth surviving for, what's worth recovering uh, for, and then, you know, put it there. And then if you fall on your face – Get up and say, all right, I took a hit. Ugh, shake it off and get back on the horse or get back in, 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 the, in the ring and keep fighting, keep plugging away because that's where, that's where the glory is. That's what matters. And that's when life begins to matter. So anyway, that's my little spiel, I guess. Thank uh, you, John. No. <clears throat> um, unlike John, I never served in the military, so there's a very real chance that I'm talking out of my ass here and maybe John can <laughs> confirm. But uh <laughs> From from what I have observed, people initially enlist, people initially join the military, make that decision for a wide variety of reasons that maybe have nothing to do with such noble causes, but as they continue to move through their training and they develop that uh, kinship, that, that fellowship with the people around them, those kind of strong bonds as they learn the importance of what they're doing, those values shift and the why f- becomes deeper as they continue to move through this. So true. Um, And I think that that's really important when we're talking about recovery too, because as we move into our recovery, that why grows deeper. It, it transcends and includes, it expands, it moves to something beyond ourselves. But in the beginning, you have to start with something, with whatever it is and ask, well, why, why is this the case? Um, We talk about, sacrifice a lot and this certainly is relevant on veterans day as well but what am i sacrificing for why is it important and recovery at first it can feel hard to give up something that you know has sustained you for so long that has kept you from from i don't know the hell of what early recovery can be as you're detoxing this um or protecting you from dealing with whatever emotional trauma, you need a compelling enough why to stop that. And there are not always going to be other people that are in your life to motivate you to make that choice. So start with whatever why you can find and allow it to grow as your sobriety deepens. But the critical thing is to keep asking yourself, digging deeper and deeper and allowing that reason to grow and expand and change as it does, we're going to find too, as we keep digging in and asking this why, that each of our root values is different. 
Um, this mm. in some ways relates to typology as well, because all the types care about different things, have different desires, have different things that are most important to them. And we find out what those are, what our core values are by continuing to ask again and again and again, why is that the case? Well, why do I care about that? Well, because I value something. Why do I value that? Because of this and this. And you get down until you cannot break it to a further level of why, then you know you found your root value, the thing that you care about most. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the beginning, it is your life. Maybe it is not your life, but keep asking the question and see where it takes you. I like very much what you're saying, Doug. Thank you. A couple of things came to mind right at the end as you were talking. It's the first time I've ever realized it. It was um, um, that we've talked before here about practicing gratitudes, and I've shared before how it is that in my own practice, I began using uh, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of, of motivational needs as kind of the blueprint for how I go through my uh, daily gratitudes. But as I was listening to it, it's the first time it landed this way, is that his hierarchy um, addresses multiple levels, kind of different angles on what motivate us, and every one of them is, uh, um, is pursuant to the next. And so if you think about it, we talk a lot about here about physical well-being. All three of us are committed to good nutrition, uh, exercise, uh, rest, <laughs> I mean, just some really core values around taking care of our bodies, sobriety, hello. Um, and Maslow talks about that as foundational to all the higher order needs. If I don't have a physiological foundation, then you can forget about all the rest. And, and I even, I think as I was listening to, I was thinking about um, um, being committed to that, being committed to that, also being committed to um, uh, establishing security in the material world, kind of the lower right-hand quadrant in Wilbur's way of understanding it. But that, that that I'm grateful for becomes I'm committed to being responsible to, to maintaining my security and those that, are, are, that matter to me. Um, and that that also sets up the next level for, for Maslow, which is belongingness is what he calls it. But, but, but belongingness is founded on physiological wellness as well as uh, security, material security. That, allowed, that affords for the luxury of really connecting intimately with you guys, with my wife, with my daughter, with our families, and that that sets up the next uh, foundation. Well, according let me just to just a little bit yeah. about that. Yeah, sure, when, sure. When we when we belong, okay, nine times out of ten, we will try to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's a good belonging, you know, we will mm-hmm. yeah. not try to hurt yeah. our family. We won't yeah. try to hurt our children. Yeah. We won't try to hurt our parents because we actually. Yes something that matters the same thing yeah. with your country or your yeah. church or however you you know you do that if you belong yeah. Yeah. and a lot of a lot of uh i think addiction comes from a sense of just being lost yes you yes yeah. better yeah. There's really yeah nothing there to yeah. hold on to or nothing there yeah. to step up yeah, yeah. for so yeah. anyway yeah i i really agree with you john i i, I you know i have such a uh, um I think it's by virtue of my background in psychology, I have such a strong sense of, of the attachment dimension of addiction. And you might say the failure of attachment. And I'm not speaking theoretically, I'm speaking personally. I know that my own addiction was completely correlated with, with both trauma to attachment from the past, so those demons, but also unsatisfying attachment in the present. Um, and uh, uh, my self-medication, my way of numbing out from that pain was were my addictions. And so the opposite would stand to be the case. The antidote to that would be, why don't I build attachments and then begin to um, live in responsible relationship to those attachments? That actually relates to the next one uh, in Maslow's hierarchy, which is self-esteem. The basis of self-esteem, I believe, is acting in an esteemable way, which is rooted in one's ethics, in one's, in one's moral responsibility. And I absolutely, John, connected to our relationships to one another. I think it starts off with those most intimate to us, and then it kind of expands, as you were saying earlier. And then the final one, which relates to all that you were saying, Doug, I think, is self-actualization, is that self-actualization is predicated on all that came before. My physiological wellness, my security in the world, materially, my relationships, my operating, as you say, John, with moral integrity. Uh, 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 and self-actualization is really to actualize the gifts that have been given me. And so it seems to me that meaning I, it's the first time I've ever thought of this. Meaning situates itself in all of those levels, and there are more, but that's a simple kind of cartography of it. You know, and after self-actualization, mm-hmm. probably becomes service. 
Yeah, yeah. Then you gotta give it back, you know. And you see yeah. that in the careers of yeah. a lot of, you know, yeah. pop stars or rock stars or you know, the guys that make it through the drug phase or the partying phase, or maybe they never did that phase. Mm-hmm. But after you know, okay, here it, I have it all. You know, I've got all the gold, platinum records, all the steam, blah 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 blah, mm-hmm. everything I could ever have, money wise. And so now, what the hell do I do with it? Either yeah. you know, sing yeah. deeper into narcissism. Okay, I want to serve the world. I want to give back at this point. Yeah. So that is kind of yeah. a, and step twelve. You know, you know, you know what? When we learned when we learned Maslow in developmental psychology all those years ago, we studied just those five dimensions. But you guys know this: in the last year of his life, he established the sixth dimension, and it's in his book, "The Further Reaches of Human Nature," and it was self transcendence. He put yeah. that at the very top: self transcendence. And uh, you're absolutely right, John. Is that is that those all become in service of service? Those all become in service and service. I think I'm going to stop there for right now. There was a second thought regarding Doug, and we'll come back to it later. I loved what you said, Doug, and I, it's, I appreciate also the, uh, how it stimulated for me a reflection on my gratitudes in a way are my – I was thinking as you were talking, how do I remind myself, both you guys, how do I remind myself of why I'm here? And, and, it, and I thought, well, if I really dedicate myself to this gratitude practice for Bob Weathers, that becomes a very uh, effective means for reminding myself of, of what it is that I want to be responsive and responsible to. Um, and I can do that every day. It's like, it's like starting the day by remembering why I'm here. Bob, uh, what you're saying kind of makes me think of, and John, this plays into what you were saying too, uh, something that I wrote about in the blog post for episode 36. And Bob, you were talking about this here in uh, in that episode as well, which is belonging and the need to belong. And when we decide what group we're going to belong to, it's important to know why we're identifying with that particular group. It comes back to this notion of asking yourself why, because humans have a need to belong. It's rooted in our biology. There was a time when if we were excommunicated from the tribe, it meant death and there was nothing you could do about it. So this need to be accepted, this need to belong is part of our genetic makeup, but that can be a trap for a lot of people in addiction because you can join, for example, a a criminal organization who boosts you up for the wrong reason and makes you feel like you belong to something like part of the family, La Familia, or, Mm -hmm. you know, a gang or you know, in John's case, a cult, whatever it was, you can belong to a group who gives you that feeling, who is not supporting you in healthy ways. So it's important to continue to question and know why we're seeking to belong to this particular group. You do that by understanding what your core values are. And if you're not clear about those, we need to get clear so that we can say to ourselves, we can see clearly that, well, maybe membership with this group being accepted by this group isn't what's right for me at this time. In fact, it's holding me back from living a life of true fulfillment um, and, and, you know, hindering my growth forward up through the hierarchy of needs, up the integral spectrum and levels of development and into a path of sobriety and contribution and all the things that really become my root values as the journey unfolds. You know, and, and, and groups, um, I, I'm think the 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 uh, train spotting two is coming out, which I haven't seen, but I did see the first one, which was with a bunch of addicts, okay, at a treatment center, and it was like I oh, just saw train spotting two, John. Oh my <laughs> anyway, so in the, in the beginning of this movie, it's, I think it's in London, and they're all beautiful and hip, and they're starting to use heroin and, and dissolve, you know, and they're this family, you know, they're all cool together, and then they all end up just turning into monsters and betraying each other, and uh, you see. So, you know, even in, you know, one of the, one of the cool things about taking drugs in the beginning is you have this new culture, you know, yeah, you yeah. Crowd, everybody understands it and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So if you're, uh, you know, you go into your family, you know, dinner when everybody's not an addict and all you really care about is drugs, there's really nothing to talk about because that's your obsession and you have that group in the beginning, but that it begins to devolve into ripping each other off and, you know, because of egocentric to no centric to nihilism centric that happens in, in, uh, in the mm. group. And, and then, you know, when you study spiral dynamics at these different developmental levels, it seems to each level mm. moves through collective, individual, then you go to collective again at a higher level. So you move through these phases where you work on yourself as an individual and then you realize your collective responsibility. Then you play that to the end and you have to go back and, and pay attention to your individual development again. So there's these just different phases in life uh, where we connect and we, uh, 
disidentify with the group or identify with a newer group at a, at a different level. So that begins to, hopefully as we grow, you know, and if you're just like, mm, and, and there, you know, in this lifetime, you're just going to be at this level and that that's it. But, you know, we, we're talking about people who are engaged in, in integral practice. And as far as we can see it is it is the, uh, the way you really grease the evolution individual machine and collective machine. And we start working on this stuff and we will see ourselves advancing into higher levels of, uh, of care, development, capacity, uh, skill, et cetera. You know, one of the most powerful examples uh, for me that I've read that discusses what you're saying, John, and we've mentioned it here before, but it really uh, left a huge impression on me, is Viktor Frankl's book, A Man's Search for Meaning. Hugely important. All three of us have read that. It's a detailing his experience in the German extermination camps. And he, he, he differentiated between those that somehow rose to the challenge ethically to be a person of integrity versus many more who didn't weren't capable of getting around the corner and became in his words, less than animals was exactly what we're talking about. And I love how he quotes Nietzsche in that book who said that he who has a why to live can deal with any how. And so in that circumstance, if I have a why, not only for myself personally, it manifests collectively. And so those are the people that reached out altruistically to one another. In fact, it was his view that those are the ones that actually survived. Uh, and, and what guided most of them, he talks about his own example, he wanted to write the book. He wanted to live to write the book. He, wanted, he felt like this experience has taught me something. But, he's, but he discusses in the book how what it was that kept people going is, I want to live for my uh, family's sake, for my family's legacy. I want to live to make a difference in humankind. I want to make a difference to make sure this never happens again. All of those reasons and people survived owing to that. So I love the way that he weaves together the deeply personal, individual sense of meaning completely co-informed by its situ- being situated in the, in the collective. You know, and very powerful. You know, we don't, we don't talk about uh, mm-hmm. him enough and logotherapy, you mm-hmm. know, and treatment. It's so, it's so essential. And he basically mm-hmm. said, everybody has a need uh, for meaning. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if you do not find meaning in your life, you know, mm-hmm. uh, deep, real meaning, mm-hmm. you're basically screwed. You know, you're yeah. never going to find that compass, you know, that magnetic North in your life in the direction yeah. you're supposed to be going on. And that's, uh, you know, uh, it's an essential part, and it should, needs to be emphasized so much. And I'm, I don't know. Uh, and it kind of helped. You kind of need people who have kind of found it, you know, who are already initiated into having found the meaning of their life in order to initiate the people coming under them, you know, to, to elder them and to, to help them find that self and help them to cut through the bullshit, you know. And, and go How do there. you spot it? How do you spot it, you guys? Can you spot that in somebody? Just following what John said. Is somebody who's carries carries meaning in their I life? So. I think so. Doug, um, do you have a thought about that? You, you have any I, sense of it? <laughs> I don't have anything that that directly translates into a good okay. way to do that. It's just yeah. that really kind of intuitive sense at this point. Yeah, I like very much what you're um, raising. I interrupted you, Doug. You were going to say something else. I want to open well, up for them. I'm having a, a different thought related to what you were saying, uh, which is that finding finding our why, finding our our reason is a lot of times when you really drill down and look at it, and I'm willing to, to discuss this and be proved wrong here, but my theory at least is that this is all related to the cessation of suffering in some form or another. And it starts with my own and expands later to ending the suffering of others. Um, for, for Viktor Frankl, and again, I don't presume to know what was going on explicitly inside his mind other than what I have read from him, mm-hmm. but... Initially, it was to get through that suffering, to see that suffering end so that he could end the future suffering of others. Addicts, people in recovery, have a built-in suffering that is just absolutely terrible, devastating, painful. And initially, the why is to escape that and later becomes to help other people live a better life and never deal that same thing. Same with survivors of trauma, same with people who have experienced uh, violence and, and, and war and all these kind of things. We have a why to survive it ourselves so that we can work to prevent others from ever having to experience it in the future. But first, the why is surviving to make it to that point. 
addicts, when you're struggling to find your why, can look at our own suffering as a starting place and use that as a motivation to get through it. And, and the, there's a difference. I mean, I think there's no way, you know, that we can totally avoid suffering unless we're some kind of enlightened state and we're, you know, we step off the wheel. But here in the relative world, you know, suffering is just part of it. So how do we embrace noble suffering and reject ignorant, stupid, useless suffering? You know, I mean, suffering uh, uh, accepted actually leads to, to growth and compassion and wisdom. Uh, suffering avoided as in let's do drugs so we don't have to feel these this pain anymore uh, obviously leads to destruction and you know just an immense multiplication of suffering and suffering without meaning or purpose or anything it's just hell you know yeah there's there's a real key point there that pain i think there's pain and suffering and pain is unavoidable pain we can face and deal with suffering though is the meaning that we attach to it mm-hmm. so you can feel pain but not mm-hmm. suffer from it because you're telling yourself a different story about it. Mm-hmm. And so the stories I, we... I want to bookmark something, you guys, following on what both of you are saying. I'd love to, uh, in a future episode, maybe even in two episodes for that matter, I'd love to revisit this and dive into to this piece that we're talking about because I feel like it's really key. I don't know that it's discussed often enough, at least in my experience in recovery context, but I, I don't know how to frame it. It'd be something like, the gift, the gift uh, inherent in addiction, or the gift inherent in hitting bottom, the gift inherent in facing death, thinking of you, John, uh, facing depression, and, and how it is that there is a bifurcation. There are two forks. There's a fork in the road, just the way you're saying it, Doug, it seems like to me. I'd love to go deeply into that for a whole podcast if you guys would be interested. I think there's so much in what you're both suggesting. Can we uh, put a postscript and come back to that maybe? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, and this is something, you know, something I want to clean, uh, clean up, Doug. When you first started speaking way back, you know, it seems like decades ago when we started this podcast, this mm-hmm. episode, I started laughing, and it wasn't because of anything that you mm-hmm. said, but what you, I wasn't laughing at you, but when you said that, whatever it was, it had this vision in my brain the first day of basic training, and we all got off the bus and they just cut our hair off. I mean, they didn't leave you any hair in Fort McLellan in 1979, okay? We were like, you know, we look like Yul Brenner or, you know, Zen monks with all our, you know, ridiculous civilian clothes on. We're all sitting around looking at each other. It's like, oh, we're fucked now. You know, and we're just right off the block smoking and smoking. <laughs> like, oh, no. And then, of course, then the older guys are running by, you know, or you'll be sorry, you know. <laughs> so it's just that moment. And then 18 weeks later, you know, because I was an MP, we went through 12 weeks of basic training. Then we had another... I don't know, 10, 12 weeks of advanced individual training. We didn't get to change forts or change drill sergeants. It was just one thing. But uh, 18 weeks later, looking at the same people and the transformation that we've gone through in our attitudes and our professionalism, we were hardened physically and emotionally and, and intellectually. And we, you know, we were ready to do the job in just a very brief time. And uh, I think it's a really good model to have for, I mean, the military knows how to transform and train people. They've been doing it pretty good for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think um, we can use uh, a lot of that in treatment, you know, because a lot of treatment, when you get to holistic level, that means green. That means, you know, just almost in incurably nice, you know, and (laughs) and nice will get you about a C minus in this game. I mean, you know, obviously, but compassion manifests itself in many ways. And sometimes you have to have structured discipline, butt kicking, in your face love in order for for um to start creating that in the individual we're working with where they can take that on and, and do that themselves and kick their own butts you know after a while and, and hold themselves accountable but in the beginning you you need that uh structure and you need that that idea beyond yourself the heroic ideal and you know if i'm if i'm going to pull myself out of this this horrible pond that i'm in you know of, of just uh, darkness and uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to to uh, do the work you know I have to get my act together and uh, so anyway John it occurs to me as you're speaking that boot camp is an incredibly painful experience right you you go and you suffer you work hard you do push-ups until you can't move or it's hilarious sometimes you know I mean it's, you know 
but you better not laugh out loud or you're really screwed. But anyway, yeah. But, but there's a really painful experience in there that catalyzes the transformation hmm. is, is the key, the key here. And in addiction, that can be a gift too. We just have to use that pain in a way that catalyzes the transformation for growth. And mm-hmm. in boot camp too, and I have read this uh, particularly in the case of buds, it is the brothership there, the, the kinship with your fellow standing beside you that you avoid, not, not avoid, but you manage, you handle, you confront and overcome your own suffering and the pain that you're feeling by helping the guy next to you and making sure that you're both going to be okay and knowing that they would do the same for you. And those are the ones who make it you know, recovery, it's absolutely the same thing. It's in being there for one another Mm -hmm. and having that common goal of not letting one another suffer anymore Mm -hmm. that we, that we make it through and grow and eventually realize that deeper connection. Why should, why should those values be, be limited to buds training or to the military? It's insane. It's basic humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the old story about, uh, uh, in hell, everybody had a very long spoon and they couldn't, they were all trying to feed themselves, you know, and everybody was starving to death because they couldn't do that. Nobody thought to feed the person in next to them in heaven. Everybody had the same spoons, but they were feeding each other. So at some point we have to, we have to break out of that, that just, you know, and it got to help us, you know, you know, just we, we, we've, we've fallen into this, this dark cavern of, you know, uh, greed as being the highest value. And, you know, I mean, our, in, in Congress, they don't even blush anymore about, about being corrupt. You know, it's like, we're not here to serve the people of our district. We're here to, to we're here to serve the, the corporations that bought us off. And if we can't, uh, you know, we can't come through with their legislation, they're going to cut us off. I mean, they just talk about that openly now. I mean, there's no sense of service of country of, of, you know, uh, a patriotism or matriotism or earth or family or, or humanity. It's all about just greed. Mm-hmm. And that's just often you, and, and you can, you know, you can throw in some, some, uh, you know, racism and sexism, this is and that is and different kind of hatreds kind of stir this all up, but basically, uh, or keep people, you know, keep working class and middle class voting against their own interests. But basically, you know, at some point, at some point, we got to start caring. And, and I was thinking about this earlier, I was meditating, you know, you look at the Middle East and look what's going on there, you know, obviously they hate us. Okay. And they hate the Israelis. I'm talking about the, the Muslim world, but right now they hate each other more than they hate us. So that gives a little break. And Lebanon's about ready to go to war with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. I don't know what's blowing up over there, but, and the only way really out of there um, uh, is we got to evolve our way out. Yeah. You know, we've got to evolve our way out. And, uh, you know, not, not so long ago in our history, you know, Catholics and Protestants were slaughtering each other and, mm-hmm. and uh, just, you know, massacring each other on and on and on. We kind of moved beyond that, but we've really got to, yeah. And, th- and that's what, uh, that's, a, that's a good kind of um, uh, a guiding light for maybe integral, not maybe, but for integral recovery. So we have to evolve our, our we have to evolve ourselves out of our, our diseases and where we're at. And to get to those better versions of ourselves, and the more of us that do that, the better world we're going to have, and the more hope and chances we're going to have to do what we need to do. But that all comes from the process of othering, from from looking at people as different from myself. Greed is there is me, and I am the most important. These, uh, you know, racism, sexism, all this stuff is you people are different than me. What happens in basic training? what happens in a treatment center when you're doing it right is there's a sense of we're all in this thing together. We take care of one another, not because we're different, but because we realize in that moment that we are the same. And that that, that realization of sameness is what enables the growth to occur. And so as we learn to see ourselves the same as others, which we do through the act of taking other perspectives and seeing that we're not so different after all, we stimulate our, our growth and our maturity as individuals and as a species. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. We should wind down, I think. We have a... We have well, a, a, a I just want okay. to props, props for AA and mm-hmm. how they've, they've done that mm-hmm. really well in many, many cases. They've been there for each other. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Same for, sure. for sure. For so, anyway. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we uh, well, wrap this.
I think it's, I think it's a, a great coverage of what's inspired by Veterans Day. I really appreciate you introducing this, uh, this vantage point today, John. It's great. And we will continue. Um, our next podcast will be featuring someone who's working in the community in a very vital way. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll be introducing that. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy the next podcast, too. Thank you both, gentlemen. Yeah. Douglas, John. Blessings yeah. to all. Yeah.